Well, um, I, I just want to say thanks for everyone coming, team students, and especially you people who came from St. John's or Ireland, um, a little bit farther away. We really appreciate you guys coming. So I don't think I should really bother with an introduction because I don't really know all of you that well. So <laughs> those uh, purposes are better served with you introducing yourselves. So you guys want to introduce yourselves? Come on up. I suppose we'll do the introductions first. I'm Sean Quigley. This is uh, Sherry. Uh, and I'm Eve, Mary Lowe. So we're going to give you a quick chat this evening about the sort of competition uh, that we ran and we won back home called the Irish Times competition. Um, so if you guys don't mind, I prefer to do it in something more of a conversational style. So don't wait till the end if you have any questions. Uh, just put your hand up. Do something different with your body that I know you want uh, my attention. And uh, ask any, any questions. And hopefully by the end of it, uh, you'll know a lot about the competition, and we hope to actually run a quick uh, Irish Times debate at the end of the evening. So have a think about uh, anyone in the room that you're going to speak with, because it is a team event, uh, and we'll, we'll finish tonight with a, with a quick competition. If I can start with a, a word of thanks, thank you very much for uh, having us here, uh, for inviting us, and for, uh, for showing us such a good time. Uh, we have, as debaters back home, often had to debate in uh, unusual or different environments or colleges. Uh, certainly the Empire State Building uh, ranks <laughs> as one of my more, my more memorable places uh, that, I, that I can say I debated. I'm fascinated that the Empire State Building has a downstairs. I always <laughs> it you were dumb, uh, as if you didn't have enough space to work with, uh, you could go down. And if anyone ever said to me there was a college downstairs in the underground of the Empire State Building, I would have assumed it was a spy school. <laughs> uh, training special assassins. Um, but this, this is better. This is the uh, elite wing of the American Irish Times uh, debaters. So what I want to do very briefly is discuss why the, the Irish Times competition exists um, and then break it down into, into, I suppose, the competition itself and the format that the competition takes. Because in, there was a time that there was only one time where the format took place and that was in the Irish Times competition. But now the competition is just referred to as the Irish Times style. And sometimes at Worlds they've decided to run competitions within that and just call it the Irish Times style of debating. The reason why the Irish Times Commission um, exists, and later on, Niall's going to be talking to you about the kind of uh, argumentation and content of a speech, and he's going to talk to you about style. I think during their presentations, you'll really get to understand more how different it is from, or, or, or how the, the emphasis is on different skills, different parts of the speech than perhaps British parliamentary style. And that's exactly why the Irish Times is so important um, to us in Ireland. Um, so much of our history, so much of our development has stemmed from rhetoric. Uh, people making passionate speeches on, on soapboxes and forcing political change and bring, bring new things about. That there is more to debating than just competitions. And there is more to debating than maybe making technical points and clashes and buzzwords and phrases. And the Irish Times very much tries to hang on to that. Because we, our debating would stem from in the universities' weekly meetings, uh, what we would call house debates or chamber debates, where you might invite a politician into chair or to speak. But there would be nothing up for grabs, there would be no prize, it would just be an audience and 20 people speaking, one prop, one up, and just clashing with ideas. Um, and that, that got lost to a certain extent the more and more we focused on British parliamentary type debates and competitions and competitive debates. Suddenly the skill wasn't to try and win the crowd over anymore, it was to win over the two or three adjudicators that sat in front of you. And the Irish Times, I suppose, that's, that's the biggest difference between the Irish Times and the British Parliament. There'll be some structural differences we'll go to in a minute. But in terms of its ethos, in terms of, of why it exists, that's why that there will still exist a competition and a priority and an importance for public speakers to remember that what we're trying to do is convince people to your, to your way of thinking or what you're trying to say, not just convincing the two or three adjudicators who've heard this debate 15, 20 times before. They're waiting to hear the lines. They're waiting to just tick, tick things in boxes. The Irish Times focuses on winning the crowd over and the masses over, and the adjudicators on the night bear that in mind for the speeches. The Irish Times itself is a, is a newspaper in Ireland. It's, it's the Journal of Record. It's the main newspaper, and they sponsor uh, the competition. That's why it's called uh, the Irish Times uh, Debating Competition. I hope they continue sponsoring it, because otherwise they have to come up with a new name, uh, which, which is, you know, wouldn't be the same. So, I suppose what I'll try and do now is to talk about the competition itself uh, and then the actual format of the competition. What we'll be doing tonight will be um, 
not quite a final because we'll all we'll all be in teams, of course, uh, starting off. But the, the the competition itself starts with 140 teams, uh, and, and the discussion of the competition and the format are kind of going to kind of blur into one. So it's at this stage that if you're not following me or if you have any questions at all, just just bang up the hand and we'll go through it. The unique thing about the Irish Times is that in the final you will have both teams and individuals um, speaking. The competition starts off with 140 teams from all the universities all over Ireland. Any university can enter, any individual can enter, as long as they are a student in the university and they have a teammate. And this year was the 50th anniversary uh, of, of the competition. So it had uh, particular interest and there was 100, 140 teams, which wasn't particularly much more than other years, but it was, it was a very good, good turnout. And the competition lasts four rounds. It's only actually four debates. So if you get through your first round, you can tell your mates you're in the quarter-final of, uh, of the Irish Times. Um, but there's a huge cut, a huge cut of teams all the way through. So in the, in the, in the first round, you would have uh, five teams on each side. Could be four, would never be six, but, but, but five teams uh, on each side. So that's, that's ten speakers, each giving a seven-minute speech on each side of the house. So like you bring a packed lunch with you, because it's, it's, it's a long one. It is, it is a very, very long one. And at the end of that first round, two teams and two individuals go through. So what I'll do now is I'll just kind of explain the, uh, the nature of, the, of, the, of, have, of an individual progressing. So the adjudicators will first of all select, and um, they, will be, they will be ranked. They will select their, winning, their, their top two winning teams. And after that then you have uh, 10 minus 2, which is 8 teams left, potentially in contention. They can't go through as a team. But there are, still, there are still slots for two individuals. So the adjudicators can split teams. They can pick any two individuals from the remaining eight teams and say, I'm putting you through as an individual and I'm putting you through as an individual into the second round. Now, those two individuals don't become a team. They remain individuals all through the competition. And from that round on, there's, there will be teams and individuals in every subsequent round. Interesting little things there is that they can, sometimes, and it has happened, select the two individuals from the same team. That team gets split and they're now two individuals and they carry on. So once, once the two winning teams are selected, everyone else in the room is in contention to, be, to progress as an individual. And that's how the competition continued, Jeff. Uh, why, did, why did they decide to not just put through uh, teams and why did they decide to split into individuals as well to get the, um, in the competition? So do you mean why do they decide to put the two individuals through, or why do they have the individuals? Well, why do they have why do they have individuals going through as opposed to just having three teams going through, for example? Right, because basically the individual, well, basically when when you get to this to subsequent rounds where you have individuals in it, it brings a whole new, unique thing to the competition because you suddenly no longer are are handcuffed by the team positions, and it also makes sure that the Irish Times is completely different from British Parliamentary. It makes sure that if you, if you just had teams, they would be likely to revert back into their kind of um, team positions. And it means on the night that you have, and I'll, I'll go more down to it when we're talking about the type of, the type of speeches that, that people give, but just to answer your question, I'll, I'll fast forward a bit in that an individual is not tied to a teammate. It is, a, it is very much an individual speech on the night. And he doesn't have to have a team line. He, he has the freedom to pick a very obscure, obscure point, a very off the wall point, and build it and make it his personal or her personal speech. And the other, the other side of it is, that, well actually no, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave the second, the second part until I'm talking about uh, the individuals more. Unless, do you, do you guys want to add anything to that? Yeah, essentially it just means that instead of it being a straight lock between teams, you also have this kind of fun random element in the middle of the debate, where you have the individual speaking. Yeah, actually, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say now, When all the teams are lined up, you don't, the teams don't speak like they do in British Parliamentary. Uh, first speaker, first speaker on the, on the opposite side. Second speaker on the first team. It doesn't go like that. The first speaker from the first team speaks. The first speaker from the opposing team speaks. Then the first speaker from the second team speaks. Mm -hmm. Then the first, and it continues going down. And then when you get to the end of the debate, when you get to, when you get to the end of the room, it comes all the way back for a second speaker. So factor in how long the first round is. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff, there's a lot of stuff to get through. And when you get to the final, the individual, or, or sorry, the subsequent rounds, actually the final, the semis and, and, the, and the quarters, having individuals there adds a whole new dynamic because 
the team goes, then the first speaker and the second team goes, then the individuals, then the individuals, and then all the way back to the team again. So you, you, in terms of winning the crowd over, the crowd have been hit with four very different speeches. You have someone who's not tied to a team line, you've got someone, and of course, the teams won't necessarily pound the individuals, because the individuals will compete against themselves in a way. So really and truly, the, the, crowd, the crowd really are spoken to, and it adds a whole new element to the teams then, because you must not only, sometimes you've got to win the crowd back, and then progress without hitting them with statistics and facts, because you know most people off the street don't want that. And the thing with the Irish Times, remember, is anyone could walk off the street and sit down an Irish Times round and completely understand what's going on. There wouldn't be a term, there wouldn't, there wouldn't be a debating term that they wouldn't understand. There wouldn't be any terminology thrown at them. It would just be very much uh, a conversation. Now, I mean, we don't, we're not clowns. Like we don't talk to them like you know. <laughs> we, we, you know, we do use, but we like to think some technical terms. I mean, you know, if they're if <laughs> As I like to say, if there are a man on the street that doesn't understand the Irish Times, that's why they're on the street. <laughs> um, so, after, after the first round then, you get in a situation where um, you just have two teams on either side and two individuals. And it runs through, runs through that format, and again the judges pick. And, and this is where it gets different. The judges now pick teams, two teams and two individuals from that round uh, as well. Then you get to the semi-final, where it's only one team and one individual progress, and then you get to the final. And the final this year was on in the Helix, which would be a fairly big uh, kind of concert hall in Dublin, in DCU, which is Dublin City University. It was a black tie uh, event. And the motion we discussed was that this house would owe Fianna Fáil a debt of gratitude. And Fianna Fáil would be the uh, party who's been in government in Ireland. I mean, it has been coalitions government, they've shared it various times. But essentially they've been in the main party and government. This is the foundation of the state, uh, essentially. And you get 10 days, you get your motion 10 days in advance. Mm -hmm. So it's not done on the hop. So there's, there's kind of research required because you've had 10 days. So there is going to be an analysis deeper than what you would do in 15 minutes preparation. But at the same time, no one wants to be preached at. Like it isn't, it isn't a battle of statistics. It isn't a battle of, of kind of... Um, you know, I have found a quote from some guy that you haven't, because you, you know it's it's about putting a, putting a thread together and sort of winning the crowd with you. So when the when the teams start off, they will try and have a consistent team line, whereas the individuals will try and bring something different, something individual uh, to the debate, and that's and that's basically um, how it goes. But just to say, in terms of the, the format, as you've probably guessed by now, it isn't as rigid as the British Parliamentary. I mean, the opening, with the exception perhaps of the first speaker on the night, he of course, or she, has to give some sort of definition of the motion of what we're, talk of what we're talking about. But it isn't necessarily as role specific as British Parliamentary. Um, in the Irish Times you can, you know, within reason, you can actually conceive certain arguments, or certainly you can choose not to address every argument head on. So, if, if there are five or six arguments on the table, you can't choose to only ignore three of them and just tackle your two. You know, it isn't in British Parliamentary where you would be, you, you know, you'd be punished if you brought in new material as, as the second speaker and the second team. Uh, those sort of strict regime procedural rules, I suppose, don't apply in the Irish Times. Again, yep? Do you have to agree with everyone who's spoken before you on your side? No, okay. you don't. Um, you would probably, you, it wouldn't be a very good idea. I don't think you'll have to the right of redefinition. Yeah, and except you have right of redefinition, but you have to do it nicely. Okay. And if you were to say, I think that the previous team on my side was wrong, then it, it's not necessarily that you lose marks, it's just yeah. not good editing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but That's you can't say, good. they've looked at it from this angle, uh, we're going to look at it differently, we have a different point, okay. and you're not going to be criticised for that. It's something that Niall would be going to more, it's probably in his chat about, you know, argumentation and content. But no, the answer is, is no, there is no rule. You can do it to like, you, you could sing during your speech in the individual. You could dance. You could do an interpretive mime. You know, <laughs> like, whatever you think works, they're, they're not, I would not suggest Has anyone a, wanted to debate in a person. No. no. <laughs> but, but, but there certainly is a large scope for, for, for humour and being different and stuff like that. But no, there are no strict rules. I mean, I think it, it wouldn't be, it's never really a good idea to, to totally knife someone when in the Irish Times 
you have the option to just ignore them. You know, whereas in British parliamentary, you, you have to thread it all in. In the Irish Times, you can just, just ignore them and carry on. I mean, I suppose in that regard, maybe the easiest way of describing it is, it's as much public speaking as it is debating. I mean, you do prepare a speech for your Irish Times. It isn't done on the fly. So obviously, during it, I mean, I'll leave this more to, to Niall, but obviously during it, you'd be listening and you'd be factoring, you'd be, you'd be folding those arguments in to what, what you're saying, you're making sure no one's stolen your arguments, but you are, you're an island uh, in, the, in the debate. Yep? Um, in, in some other formats, um, specifically some American formats, a lot, a lot of times definitions are really squirreled. Mm. Um, does, that, does that happen where you'll have the Irish Times and someone will define some motion in such a crazy way that everyone who's prepared something automatically has their case or their arguments obs like made obsolete? It's more, it's more, again, I'd say it's probably something more that now I was talking about. I was trying to talk about the actual format of, of the debate on the night, like not on the motions. But the motions are not open. They are fairly tied, they're fairly specific. The motion I had for the semi-final, to give an example, was this house would get Labour to run the next government. Uh, I mean, Labour is a political party back home. There's very little room for squirrel there, unless we're not so pregnant women or something running. running. <laughs> <laughs> the motion before that was um, something against social networking sites. Um, this house regrets the rise of social networking sites. Again, that's a fairly straightforward one. So there wouldn't be, be much squirreling. And to be honest, for the simple reason that if you squirrel, the next team isn't bound to continue oh, your okay. your definition. So you'll just come across as a bit of a kind of someone who tried to be a bit too clever. You know, so the next team mm -hmm. and nor is the opposition bound to stick with your definition. You know, they just stand up there and say, look, what are we all here to talk about tonight? Are we here to talk about the motion? Are we here to talk about what you want to talk about? And because you are in the audience over, you know, that that that'll probably do. So are there any other questions just on literally on if you on, on how if you were to enter the competition, how how the actual format of the competition goes as opposed to the debates. Uh, yeah, I'll take the time, so. If it's about winning over the audience, does any audience member watching the debate have a say in like how the debate is adjudicated, or do you still have a panel of adjudicators like you wouldn't? No, you would have you have a panel of adjudicators, but importantly, uh, for example, to adjudicate the final, you have to have won the Irish Times. To adjudicate the, the semi finals, you have to be in the final of the Irish Times. So uh, and so everyone who is judging knows what the Irish Times is about and they're looking for those those um, you know, those traits that make, make the Irish Times. And you know, it isn't, it isn't necessarily that judges have to be proactive in terms of just what they're looking for. It's just in, in, in proactive and sort of pushing the, the crowd. It's more that when something would come up that would be a deal breaker in British parliamentary, the judges know that it's not a deal breaker in the Irish Times. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah. Are, are there POIs and what kind of heckling happens? Good question. There are, yeah, there are POIs the exact same as, um, as you'd be used in British parliamentary. Every speaker in the Irish Times would be expected, I mean you might get away from the early rounds, but certainly the semi-final and the final, you would have to accept at least one point of information. Mm. Definitely have to accept at least one. Um, possibly two. There are other exceptions? Did you take them? I forgot to have last time. Wow. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, one second. In, terms of, in terms of heckling, no. The audience wouldn't be encouraged or allowed to heckle. However, the audience definitely plays a big role in the semi-finals and finals. There would be a crowd in the semi-finals, there would be a huge crowd in the final. And, I mean, if, if, if you have the crowd with you, if the crowd are laughing at your jokes, I mean, that's, that's, that's 20 seconds during your speech where, where people are laughing, so you've got to factor into your time. Rounds of applause, I mean, it's hard for a speaker not to win the Irish Times if they've been interrupted two or three times by applause. I mean, in Eve's speech in, 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 the, in, in her final, it was going so well to the crowd in the palm of her hand that she actually had to say, listen, save it till the end or I won't get to, I won't get to finish my speech. So, <laughs> so there's no heckling in that regard, but the audience are very much okay. uh, alive in the Peter Gresham. Uh, yes, you said you got motions 10 days in advance. Is that before every round or just finals? Yeah, before every round. Uh, I, mean, I mean, it can work out that you could get a little bit more, a little bit less, uh, because the rounds could be over, over, obviously the finals on one night, the semi-finals the semi -finals run over four nights. So if you just happen to be in the last semi-final, you might have 11 days, where if you're in the first semi-final, you might only have nine days. But 10 days is what they, what they aim for. So have you prepared ahead of time for every single round, and then if you get knocked on the first one, the preparation for the other two just... Oh no, sorry, no. No, the, the motion only gets released 
the motion for that debate only gets released 10 days before it's on. So each round is 10 days apart? No. 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 Sorry, no. So the first round, the first round, so we go back to college in, in sort of September and the convener sends out uh, letters to all the colleges inviting people to enter teams. Some colleges will enter up to 12 teams. Uh, and then the motion for the first draw is made. So it would be, for example, take, take my college, and I suppose they enter six teams, it would be Griffith A, B, C, say there's four teams, A, B, C, and D. There's no names but to those teams yet. And then the rounds, then the motions come out and be right. This is the first motion, it has Griffith A, it has St. John's B, it has Trinity C, all the teams, and, and there'll be a date, and it'll be 10, round, 10 days from that date. But then the individual, this is another little, little quirk the Irish Times has, then the college itself decides who will be Griffith A, who will be Griffith B. And the way it normally works is whoever has won the right to be top seed will look at all the motions Griffith are in and go, yeah, I prefer this one, I'll be Griffith C, I prefer this one, I'll be Griffith B. So very often the A team is going under the name of the D team. That's just a little, little, little aside. So then after that debate then, things get tabulated, there'll be another round before Christmas, which will be the quarter final, and say that's on in, in November. Ten days before that debate, you get an email and the motions get released. Then the semi-final, the semi-final the finals happen very close together. The semi-final happens, say, the first week of February. And you would have gotten your motion ten days before that. And there would have been nothing between the, the quarter-final and the ten days before the semi-final, if you follow. And then in, at, at the last semi-final, when they've decided who the four teams and four individuals are, they announce the motion for the final and they actually do the draw there and then. So all the teams are there and they, they draw who's going to be first prop, who's going to be first up. And then 10 days after that, I think we actually have a bit longer than something, was it two weeks, two weeks after that, the, the final, final happens. So this is a debate tournament in a much different sense than we're used to seeing a debate tournament where it's just a bunch of rounds, like three, yeah. two or three, in two or three days. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's uh, a series of public debates. Series of public yeah. debates. So, you have, so you have four rounds of props, four months. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Any other questions? So the winner can be either a team or an individual? Yeah, sorry, good, great question. So on the night then of the final, they announce the winning team and the winning individual. So there is a great benefit of being in the final as a winning team because your odds of winning something are better because you've got a one in four chance of being the winning team. There are four teams, one of them must win the winning team. And then after that then, they announce a runner-up and getting the runner-up team can be a rough one because it probably means you're either running for the, uh, the individual prize, if you know what I mean. And then they announce the winning individual. And just like at the, at the very, very start, everyone is left in contention for the, be for the best individual. So on the night, these guys were announced to the winning team. There were three teams left and four individuals, all of whom were in contention for winning the... Uh, they weren't in contention. I ran. I won by a mile. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but in, in, in theory, any one of them could have won the individual prize, including somebody from the team. Hmm. So, say for example, it was very close. Hypothetically, wasn't these guys definitely ran away. With it. Say it was very close between them and the UCD team, and the judges lock heads and they lock heads, and eventually <laughs> they decide that these guys have won. Mm -hmm. And they go back to their notes because the first speaker and you see really was very, very good, it was very, very close, but they know they decide this team won it. Then they decide the individual. And supposing they, they've already decided that I was the best individual of the four individual speakers. Mm -hmm. But they can still include the first speaker from the losing team mm -hmm. and she or he could still be announced as the winning individual. Now it rarely happens, but it has happened before, but it rarely happens that in the final um, the winning individual will be from a team, purely because that on the night, you know, the teams are locked in, like, like they, they stick as a team, they've spread their arguments together, they've prepared as a team, they're going for that one in four chance, and the four individuals have such freedom. I mean, they, they are not tied, like, in a way, there's a debate separate to that. Mm. Like, the four teams are thrashing out, they're down in the mud and they're throwing the punches, and the four individuals are tied by nothing. They're not even really tied by the motion if they want. I mean, they could stand up and tell gags for seven minutes <laughs> if they wanted and just give a great individual performance uh, and be in contention. And I think that's why, more often than not, the winning individual is an individual, not for the team. Yeah, it's unlikely that, um, it, that with the teams preparing together, that one team it would separate themselves so much from another that they would fall into that individual. Yeah, category. I mean, I suppose 
the, uh, the, the, you make an interesting point there that um, there is always, um, I mean, getting split up from your teammates in the early rounds is, is an awful experience because you've gone from having a, a buddy doing the competition with to, um, to, now, to now being solo and having no one to prepare with. But th there certainly are a couple of people who do it on purpose. Like they, they've decided they're going on a solo run and they just either pick a teammate who is considerably weaker or else on the night they just plunge the knife into their back. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an awful thing to see unless you're one of the teams. And you're like, hee hee <laughs> They're out of it. They're out of it. So as I say, very, very rarely happens, but... Um, and realistically, once you get to the final, uh, both the speakers on the team are of quite a high standard, are quite good debaters. Mm -hmm. uh, so one is unlikely to stand out that much from the other. Mm -hmm. Like in the earlier rounds, you have one speaker who's an awful lot better than their teammate. By the time you get to the final, that's very unlikely. So, how did you end up as an individual? How did I end up Well, <laughs> we were very unfortunate, actually. I'll tell you a very, very little quick story, and then I'll pass over to the guys to do the, uh, the, uh, the content stuff. Because whilst the format is unique, what you give in your speech, I think, is really what differentiates it from what you're used to. I, um, myself and my teammate got split up in the quarterfinal. Jane was her name, great friend of mine. Uh, she's in my she's a final year law student with me as well. And we are from Griffith College. And the motion we had was that Collins and Griffith should not have signed the treaty. It's referring to the, the peace treaty they signed, 1916 treaty, which basically... Um, 1922. 1922 treaty. <laughs> <laughs> she was the researcher. She did all the research. Um, we brought an end to the, um, to, to the conflict back home, but they, did, they only took, basically, it was a treaty where they took the 26 counties and not the 32. So everyone who'd been fighting for 32 counties, put them left out, led to a civil war, a uh, whole lot of bloodshed. But it was Collins and Griffith who went over to sign the treaty. I was speaking from Griffith College, Dublin. So we had to stand up in our first speech and basically say, Sean Quigley from Griffith College, Dublin, thinks Griffith should not have signed the treaty. He was a traitor. Uh, and, and, like, so I, I had to muddy the name of my institution for, for the whole while. And I mean... Successfully, apparently. So, well, I don't know. I, I think it was more difficult for Jane because she was the first speaker in the debate. So, so like, we were the opening government team and she was the open government speaker. Uh, by the time it got back to me, it was a whole other debate. We were actually debating like a, a small little thing in it. And um, so we didn't get through as a team, and I got through as an individual. So it was, it was disappointing to get, to get split up, but we didn't, we didn't do a knife or, a, you know, shaft each other or, or go on a, a solo roll, which was great because it meant that, that she had me out in the semi-final. I still had someone to, to talk to, to, to prepare a debate. If that can happen in the, in the times. You can find yourself on a very obscure side uh, of a very very obscure motion. I think the other part of the times as well, because you had 10 days to prepare, you can actually find yourself changing your opinion a lot in that 10 days. You really get to know an issue very, very well after 10 days of not just researching it. Like, you know, if you're doing an essay or assignment, it's all about kind of researching it and, and, and getting the key points down. Maybe in British parliamentary, it's having your three main points and hitting it home. But in the Irish Times, you're thinking about it in the back of your mind for 10 days, how do I feel and how am I going to convince others to feel the same way. And you actually find yourself getting really to know a lot about a lot about a topic and a lot about an issue, which is why which is why it has such importance that that then becomes uh, not teaching but sharing the information with other people. And essentially whoever shares the information best, whoever convinces the crowd best. Like not convince the adjudicators who won the arguments, whoever convinced the crowd best that like this is the side we should be on. Essentially a uh, wins advantage. But I think that's more Nile there, so I'll hand you over to Nile. Yep. Yeah. Same deal with Sean, if I'm saying something that doesn't make sense or if you have any questions at all or any comments, just shout about or we can go with the second who's voting up, put up your hand and I'll, I'll call on you and it'll all be great. Um, okay, the, basically what I'm going to be covering is that the type of arguments that you make in an Irish Times style debate because they're a bit different from the arguments that you've been making in a British parliamentary debate. Uh, it's worth explaining two brief things first. Uh, the type of motion that you get in the Irish Times well, you do get some general ones that are similar to the type that you get in BP, things like uh, this house would ban air travel or this house would ban the eating of meat. A lot of the time, you get motions, first of all, that are very nationally oriented. Within Ireland, that means that you get the type of historical motions or political motions relating purely to Irish figures that you get, that Sean talked about. From the semi-finals onwards, it's, it, it's very rare to get a motion that doesn't have at least a couple of proper nouns in it, which largely comes down to the, to the fact that you have 10 days to prepare, so they're not afraid to have detailed motions or motions that tie in quite heavily to, to historical fact or to political fact because they know that you'll have the time to put the research in and to actually understand the issues in it, which is something that you can't always guarantee in a BP debate. 
But what that means is that you often get motions that don't have a specific policy, where the government isn't saying, this is the change that we would make to the law, this is the change that we make to the status quo. Instead, they're saying, this is something that we believe. We believe that we owe a debt of gratitude to this political party. We believe that these historical figures were right or were wrong in what they did. Which means that a lot of the time, the arguments that you're making will tend to be less technical. And the aim that you have all the time isn't to be purely right, it's to be persuasive, and it's to have an audience believe everything that you're saying. In British parliamentary, all that you want is that the judges look at their notes afterwards and say, yeah, they were more correct than the other teams, whether that's more correct on a technicality or more correct on a point of principle. You just want to be the most right team in the room. In the Irish Times, you want everyone to believe that you're the most right team in the room, which means that it doesn't matter if you're technically wrong. It doesn't matter if one of the other teams like, beats you on a, on a minor point. The Irish Times is just judged the whole way through as if there's a public audience. And for half of your debates, uh, assuming that you get the whole way through and don't get knocked out early, half of your debates do have a public audience. And like Sean said, that does play into the way that the adjudicators think. <coughs> in no small part, because when you're sitting in a room with a couple of hundred people at your back and they're clearly appreciating or clearly not appreciating something, you as a human being are going to be influenced by them. Even if the judges don't explicitly take into account whether or not the audience are applauding, it's hard to ignore something like that. But even in the early rounds, what they aim for all the time and what they look for in teams is being persuasive rather than purely being correct. Uh, as for how this plays into the type of arguments that you make, the, the first big thing to remember, and the, the most important thing perhaps, is that your arguments in Irish Times style need to be much more accessible than arguments in British Parliamentary. And Sean touched on this a bit. It, it comes into word usage. If you say words like substantive matter, or the, the constructive case that we're building, an audience of regular people don't really know what that means. They, don't understand, they, they aren't used to hearing buzzwords like that. And it makes people switch off a little bit if you sound like you're being too technical, or if you sound like you're using debating jargon that people in the real world just wouldn't use. It's also important in terms of argument building. Like, I don't know if it's quite as prevalent in American debating as it's become in Iona debating, but there is a huge tendency to say, and we all know what the social contract is, or we all know how the social contract theory boils down. Like, a, a real person who hasn't debated much goes, what the hell is the social contract? Like, I, did, did I sign that? Was I, was I correct? <laughs> <laughs> like, so that kind of argumentative shorthand doesn't work in a debating style where you're meant to be able, as Sean said, to have a man walk in off the street, listen to you, and think, yeah, that guy is just pure right. Not because he said social contract a lot, but because he, I just believed what he was saying. So the types of arguments that you make need to be something that you could say to your friends who don't debate, or that you could say to your parents or your family, and that they would believe. Uh, to Give, uh, to try and give a bit of a specific example of this, one of the motions in this year's competition was this House would not prosecute homeowners for acts committed against a criminal intruder. And if you launch into that from the government side, and you, you go, or on the opposition side rather, and you go into a complicated like legal treatise about what it means to establish a legal precedent that life isn't important, that's much more esoteric and much more difficult for an average person to get behind than an argument that relates purely to how people feel about their homes or how life is important in general. Like, essentially what you're trying to do is tell people in the audience what they already believe, but make them think that you're telling them what's right in the first place. So whichever side of that you're on, you're trying to convince people that you're the side that backs up their home, you're the side that backs up their security. Whether you're saying that you back up their security by increasing the ability that they have to attack someone who comes into their home, or whether you say you're increasing their security by not putting that burden on them, by not making it so that a criminal intruder is more likely to carry in weapons. Either way, you're telling people, our side is what makes you safer. Uh, it, the thing in the Irish Times, as opposed to BP, is that you'll never really be trying to change people's fundamental viewpoint or argue something that sounds fundamentally questionable. You're always going for something that people already believe and just trying to make them think that your side of the debate is what reinforces that. Mm. And that plays quite a bit into the, the second major thing, which is like generality of argument. Like Again, really technical or detailed arguments are, are just a no-no in the Irish Times, because if it's something that people will have trouble following along with or something that people won't feel brought along with, then they're not going to believe it. Like a broad overarching argument is much, much more persuasive to any random person who walks in than a really technical one. Which means that if you take a motion like the one in the final this year, that we owe a debt of gratitude to a particular political party or to a particular political figure, if you go really deeply into the policies of that party and you explain, well, here's what they did in terms of education, here's what they did in terms of the economy, here's the, the net increase that they've given in our GDP, like, no one cares. You're much more persuasive. Uh, yeah, go on. So, if general arguments are the best and you have so many speakers, then how can you have so many different general arguments? I mean, at, at some point, doesn't it get more and more specific and more and more nuanced? Yes and no. There's a, it gets more and more nuanced in terms of the way that you deliver your general arguments. 
like a, a better argument in terms of whether or not you owe a debt of gratitude to a political party is like ideas about what politics means in general or ideas about what amounts to an excessive service within politics. So you can get more nuanced about the type of thing about things within that. You can get more nuanced about the type of politics that a country should look for or should expect. But if you get too nuanced about the type of politics that are the type of policies that have been delivered, that's more likely to lose an audience and, le and lose them in detail. In terms of the number of teams in it, once you get through the first round, there's really the, like there's two teams on each side, and the individuals tend to look for much more uh, side points, much more tangential points. I'll get into that a bit later. But essentially, it's it comes down to two teams on each side taking some of the broad areas. And because the motions tend to be quite broad in general, because they're not policy specific, there'll often be a huge amount of different area or different ways that you can look at it. It's much easier for different teams to differentiate themselves by having by looking at different areas of a broad motion. And even within that, because unlike British parliamentary, you're not required to have an extension and your arguments don't have to be entirely new, there's much less credit given for being the first team to bring an argument out and much more credit given for being the one who makes the argument best. You do have a, a huge remit to cover ground that, you're, that the, the other people on your side have already covered, uh, that your arguments can cover the same broad area, but because you make them better or because you give a little bit more nuance in a couple of ways, you get a lot more credit for that. It's especially important in terms of rebuttal. Because the arguments that come out from the other side don't have, have to be taken down completely. You're not required, unlike a BP, to try and engage with everything. Clearly, engagement is a good thing. The more that you can like, look like you're fitting in with the debate, the more that you can make the other side look stupid. Clearly, that makes you more persuasive. But it means that you don't have to take up every single thing that comes up. Because of the nature of the competition, especially in the first round, there is a hell of a lot of material coming out from the other side. So you're free to drop the irrelevant stuff, to drop the little side points. Like, you know the way maybe you'll often stand up and be like, I'm going to spend a minute just shooting down the crazier stuff that they've said. Like, if, if something is self-evidently crazy in the Irish Times, you get to just say, you get, you get to say nothing, you get to not deal with it, you get to pretend like it just didn't happen, and move on for yourself. Like, that ties in a bit to the question you asked about random definitions, because if a team does give a squirrel that's clearly crazy, you do have the, the opportunity to say, grand, they were clearly crazy, we're going to have a chat about what the motion is actually meant to be dealing with, I get to just move on. There's a lot less emphasis put on having to tie in with the debate that first government set up, and a lot more emphasis given to the thing that we mentioned during John's uh, part of the workshop, which is the right of redefinition. In a very technical sense, in the Irish Times, you have an absolute right to set your arguments under any interpretation of the motion that you wish. The thing is that, as Neve said, you don't want to look like a bastard when you're doing that. So you don't want to stand up and say, the other guys on our side, they're nice and all, but they're stupid, so we're going to take it our own way. You're much better off saying, the guys on our side were entirely right, but we're going to look at it from a slightly different viewpoint, and that's this viewpoint. Like, within the context of the motion that I mentioned earlier, the, the idea of having a right to defend your home, like a first government team might define that as being up to the point of death, but that if you kill an intruder, then that's entirely different, that you can wound an intruder or do anything to them up to the point that you kill them. And then a second government team is entirely free to say, actually, we would include killing them under the things that we don't think you should be prosecuted for. And in a British parliamentary debate, that would mean you're getting an automatic last. Mm. In the Irish Times, that means absolutely nothing. If you make the case more persuasively, then you, get, then you are still entirely in contention. The reason for that is that because the second speaker always has time to respond to everything, because there's the, the reason why squirreling is so poorly looked upon with MBP is that if the second government team said that and the first opposition team have been defending a case that you know was entirely different and they haven't had an opportunity to respond, Whereas in this, the first opposition team have a speech later on in the debate after the second government team has spoken. So they get to engage in that way, and they can deal with whichever one of the government cases they think is more persuasive, or whichever one they think is better. So what you're looking for at all times is big ideas, and big things that, like a broad overarching theme that people will be able to understand, and a broad overarching theme that ties into the, the motion in general, but that doesn't get bogged down with technical stuff, and doesn't get bogged down with detail. In terms of how this affects the, the, the way that you speak, because as a team you can be split at all times, the, and this might be crossing over a little bit into what you're going into in terms of style and structure, the, as a team, your arguments need to be constantly reinforcing each other, while your second speaker still needs to have a bit of nuance or a bit of engagement with the debate that's gone before and a bit of extension of those arguments. So whatever argument you have, there needs to be a, a way that you can boil it down to a couple of sentences that both of you can say, or a couple of words or ideas that both of you can express quite succinctly. So, uh, as a... Uh, as oxymoronic as it sounds, you're looking for a, a, like a broad, general idea that's quite nuanced, that you can express in a couple of sentences, but that's detailed enough to show that you understand the issues well. And it's a, a tough balance you have to get, which is why there, there are some people who prefer BP to the Irish Times and just don't 
they, they, they just aren't in the Irish Times as a competition because it can be quite difficult to get into the hang of that and it can be quite difficult to understand the types of arguments that need to be made. Like if you think of it in terms, like I said, purely that you need to be able to explain it to somebody random that you know who doesn't debate at all and that's often quite a good thing in preparation for it, that you find one of your mates who doesn't debate and you're like, if I were to say this to you, would you know what these words meant? Would you get what I was trying to say? But you also want to have it to an extent that somebody listening to you will go, oh yeah, that's pretty smart. Like you want people to think, you want people to be impressed by you as a speaker and you want them to be impressed by your ideas, also completely understanding them. Like I guess that, does that broadly make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. cool. uh, in terms of individuals, and this is a, a slight side point, but the types of arguments that individuals make differ a bit from the types of arguments that teams make. They're still looking for the same stuff in terms of having broad ideas that can be generally interpreted, but they need to have something that's a bit different. Because you don't have a teammate backing you up later on, because you don't have somebody standing up and saying, these are the arguments that we made, aren't they brilliant? It means that you need to stand out that bit more within the debate. And like Sean said, because you're competing not only against the other three individuals, but against everyone in the teams who doesn't progress from a given round, you need to make yourself stand out, which means that individual arguments and individual, and individu individual lines will often be somewhat tangential to the debate as a whole. So in terms of uh, a debate about to go back to one of the ones that we talked about earlier, the idea of owing a debt of gratitude to a political party. Like, an, an opposition individual line on that might relate to the idea that we should never owe a debt of gratitude to any political party because a political party is born of the people. Like, something like that that wouldn't necessarily tie into the debate, that wouldn't necessarily tie into a proposition argument that was based around why this particular party was good, or any opposition line about why this particular party was bad, but just some thoughts that you have on the motion that broadly fall on the upside, but that don't have to tie into anything that's come before. Again, it ties into the whole thing that your arguments don't have to be based on the debate that's happened. Your, uh, your arguments can just be thoughts that are intelligent and that are interesting in and of themselves. So the individuals are often looking for a slightly crazy side point that's, you know, that's going to make them stand out and that means that people are going to go into the adjudication not looking for who said uh, a really common point better, but looking for a, a really individual idea that made one particular debater stand out. So I think that's broadly it in terms of argument. Would you guys add anything? Yeah. I'll just say that I'm going to Fair enough. Uh, if there's any questions at this point? So what happens if you get a motion that is particularly one-sided? Like you mentioned, uh, this house would ban meat consumption. How do you persuade the audience with generalities with that? Well, or, or do you not get as many Depends on which side of that you think it's loaded towards. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, <laughs> like, if you're on the proposition of that, well, what you're trying to do is convince people that... What? You see, the thing is, there can be a pretty considerable gulf between the things that make sense to people cognitively and the things that make sense to people when they're faced with a stake. Uh, so, <laughs> realistically, <laughs> the argument you make in the prop, whereby you say, it's not right that I kill a living thing so that I can experience pleasure, that's something that people will rationally realise to be true. Mm -hmm. Whereas it's quite difficult on the op to actually play in to instinct and to give the real world assessment of the debate. And also, just in a more abstract uh, answer to your question, that's exactly what the Irish Times brings to debating in Ireland, because you've 10 days to research it. So whatever side you find yourself on, however much you think you're on the wrong side, after 10 days, you were actually likely to convince yourself that you're now on the right side. Because the people who set the motions you know, have experience, they know what they're doing, they know there is two sides out there, and they know there is a clash that will happen. So once you get in, so if you've got 15 minutes to prepare, you, you might be like, God, I, I, don't know, I don't know where it's going to go. But in 10 days, you can research it, you can get the facts and figures, then you've decided you're not going to bombard the facts and figures, but you actually find yourself being fairly entrenched into that side after 10 days of research. And that's what the Irish Times gives you in Ireland. It gives you that part, like the opportunity to in fact decide what side, like have it decided for you what side you're on, cope why you're on that side. They just tell you what side you're on, you cope why you're on that side, and then you've got to argue that and convince people that that's the right side. That's an amazing competition in that regard, that in 10 days you can change how you feel about something. Obviously, you stay afterwards, so you go back to, to wherever you felt beforehand. But for those 10 days, you are like militant in the, in the side of the motion. Well, yeah. If I may uh, possibly clarify, I guess, um, the example was a good one. It's just one that you mentioned I thought was interesting. Do, do you get a lot of very uh, unpopular motions or something that would be a, a 
generally unpopular with the audience and then have to, are, are there emotions that are particularly controversial? Like, do you or, debate abortion? What, what? Yeah, like, would you debate abortion or something like? Well, yeah, essentially, the people who are, the person who runs the competition is almost always a former winner of the competition. Mm -hmm. So they know what kind of debates play well, what kind of debates don't. Um, there is, I suppose, a mindset that they don't want to run anything especially controversial, if only because it might make speakers uncomfortable to speak on a particular side. Mm -hmm. um, so generally what happens is that uh, the motion is something that's, like it always has two sides, uh, and it's always something that's very close to some people's hearts, uh, but totally not to other people. Um, like they wouldn't set something that the audience will almost exclusively agree with. Mm. Or vice versa. Like you're unlikely to get a motion that's absolutely insane or absolutely controversial. In the same way that, in, or rather in contrast to BP, where you can quite often get motions that by any rational standard are insane, but that in a technical sense you can convince people that you're right. So. If you do end up on the, the more popular side of emotion, because it will often like it's often very difficult to get emotion that will split every single person halfway down the middle. If you do end up on an unpopular side of the motion, like what you're trying to do in terms of your arguments is look for something on your side that will appeal to people either on the level that they already kind of believe it, or and this is getting back into the B thing a bit, like trying to convince them that they should believe it is sometimes quite effective. Convincing them like, yeah, at the moment, find lots of people you meet. But we should, as people, rise above our basic animal instincts. Like it's an argument like that that appeals to people, and appeals to people's general idea of something being right, as opposed to you saying we shouldn't eat meat because the health benefits of not eating meat are A, B, C. Whereas in a BB round, talking about that the health benefits or the environmental cost of eating meat might be a bit more persuasive. And in an Irish Times, right, convincing people like we as people should rise above is going to be more effective and more persuasive for the crowd. Uh, and that's what you have to remember at all times, like, that it is, like, if you got a motion that this house would eat kittens, right, boil and eat kittens, and you are proposing that. So no fried kittens. No fried kittens. Boil and kittens, and you're no like, okay, no. that's, <laughs> that's pretty much the unpopular side of the motion to be on there, right? Yes. But the test isn't to convince people, you know, like, the test isn't to prove that you should. Sometimes it can be an advantage by starting off at the unpopular side, it can be an advantage but you hear to be like, God, this guy's this guy's got a tough job ahead. Never at the end of your seven minute speech, you've just come across as a kind of decent guy who just boils kittens. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the test is that, you know, by 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 starting such a disadvantage, and there are no spent motions, but it, 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 severely device, divisive motions, but if there was one, you gotta remember that the test is different than adjudicators, so you're actually at such a disadvantage, it can become an advantage that you had such an unpopular side. You don't have to prove a side, you just have to make it sound reasonable. Yeah, as such, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Probably if there's no more questions, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thanks, so it is really nice to be here. Um, okay, so <laughs> I'm a little concerned that uh, the Irish Times has come across as a bit of a debating for dummies competition. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the case. Like, as Sean said at the beginning, it's something that came from a very strong cultural and public rhetoric. And what you see from any really successful politician who wins people over with speeches is that they're able to capture massively complex ideas and complex theories in a conversational accessible style. So that's what's happening with the Irish Times. Like for the final we had two weeks to prepare. In those two weeks we talked over every possible element of that argument. We got into a huge amount of depth and then the skill at the end is to pare that down, is to shape it in such a way that it, that it sounds straightforward, even if it's not, and that it sounds like something that isn't intimidating or that won't be excessively difficult to accept for people. Um, like one of the most valuable pieces of advice, and there's, you know, three of the most valuable pieces of advice. We'll go with this. The first one is that your goal in the Irish Times final is not to win over the judges; it's to win over the parents and grandparents who've come to watch the debate. Like they're your audience; they're the people who need to be brought along with you. The other is that. It's very important to be nice in the Irish Times, essentially. It's very important to look like you're not just blindly arguing your side of the motion. You very reasonably considered it. So a massively effective way of achieving that is to say, we've considered their side, we're willing to make this concession, but we think that ultimately it comes across on our side. So in that final motion, where we were talking about Fianna Fáil, 
the party that's currently in government. We were in a situation where, like, I hate Fianna Fáil, but you can't tell an audience of people who have voted for Fianna Fáil that they were wrong to do that. So in my speech, quite near to the start, I said, and there's lots of perfectly good reasons to vote for Fianna Fáil, we accept that, but we think that they haven't done enough for the people who voted for them. So that kind of concession just makes you look really reasonable and makes your arguments seem far better considered. Um, then the third piece uh, of advice we got is that because the competition is sponsored by the Irish Times, the day after the final there's a write-up in the Irish Times about the competition. Uh, within your speech you should, have, you should have essentially same bites, things that uh, they're going to write up in the paper, things that are really catchy. Um, and that will just, like, if you have a line that just sticks in people's mind, if you have a line that gets repeated or quoted by other people in the debate, that just keeps you in the centre of things. And that, like, a very effective way that I find of doing that is to kind of, not to explicitly quote someone, but to kind of draw on people's, like, cultural awareness. Like, we certainly would have quoted a lot of Yeats in the Irish Times this year, just kind of a reference to that, or to quote a famous speech made by a president or by a prominent politician or someone. That's the kind of thing that kind of acts as a signifier to let people know the stance you're coming from and the principle you're operating under with your arguments. Um, so if you can do that and if you can make it quite memorable, that really works in your favour massively. So in terms of like what we do with our 10 days, and I know this isn't going to apply at the end of this debate obviously, uh, you have a lot of time, particularly if you're a first speaker, you've done it through a lot of rebuttal. You have a lot of time to very carefully craft a speech, to pay a lot of attention to the specific language that you use, um, and to prepare it in quite a lot of detail. Uh, even if you are a second speaker, generally you'll have your opening minute and your closing maybe 30 seconds planned out quite carefully. Because it's like the opening joke is generally accepted to be pretty important in the Irish Times. It's what marks you out, it's what you know, let the audience get a feel for kind of the mood of your speech um, before you get into your argumentation. So start with a big principle, with a big statement, with a joke, with a quotation, with something like that. And it just draws people into your speech and lets them realise where you're going with it. Uh, and then the same applies at the end. You obviously want to finish your speech on a bang. You want to make sure that people remember these last couple of seconds. Uh, so we put a lot of work into finding something really memorable and really impressive to have there. Uh, one of the difficult, talking about the, the 10 days that we have to prep, one of the problems that can arise because, uh, with that is that we're often debating very topical issues. Uh, so Niall and I were in a situation with our semi-final where the motion was uh, that this house would abolish the Northern Ireland Parades Commission, which is a body that regulates uh, people marching in Northern Ireland because of all the troubles and stuff. While we were debating that in Belfast, the same debate was going on in the Parliament in Belfast to do the exact same thing. So for the week before the debate, this was going on in Northern Ireland. We thought the motion was possibly going to become obsolete. We thought there was possibly going to be, you know, a massive social shift in the two days between then and the debate, uh, which was quite daunting, I would say. Um, but like, we do, we do debate quite a lot of, uh, you know, very topical, very relevant stuff, which I think is kind of nice. Um, in terms of like, humour is a very big deal in the Irish Times. Uh, people like jokes a lot, obviously, and audiences especially like jokes. Uh, there's an extent to which you can um, just have, have jokes that are slightly irrelevant. If I might quote Sean's speech, uh, he got up and said, you know, we, I have three main questions to put to you in this debate. First question is, why do babies' clothes have pockets? Uh, the second question is, who coined the phrase, coined the phrase? And the third question is, uh, have Fianna Fáil served us sufficiently as a party in government? <laughs> uh, so if you just, like, you do have quite a bit of time to just win people over, to make them laugh, to have some fun, as long as in the end, you know, you draw it back and you make it relevant. Uh, but there's also obviously a lot of room for, uh, for humour that, that makes your point, essentially, uh, that backs it up. And if you can do that intelligently, that just makes you look fantastic. It makes you look both likeable and you know, very clever in understanding your points, which is ideal, obviously. Though it is, like, it's massively difficult to achieve. Uh, and you should never force humour if you don't have it. But, like, have conversations with people. Like, what I do is I talk to people, I'd, you know, throw out lines, I'd see how people respond to them, and try and find at least one or two things that shows that you are enjoying it and that you want other people to enjoy it. Uh, and, you know, draw them along that way. Uh, so the next 
Yeah, the, I, I mentioned, sure, yeah. Um, in, in British parliamentary, it seems like most of the humor is sort of pulling out something that the opposition said and poking fun at them for it. What's what's the balance in yeah. Irish Times? Is it is it trying to poke fun at the opposition or the other team, well, or is yeah, it? Yeah, in Irish in Irish BP certainly, uh, our favourite method of rebuttal is saying the other team's points in a sarcastic voice. Um, <laughs> 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 but, uh, never fails. Never. No. Uh, that generally doesn't go down too well in the Irish Times. Like I, I was actually about to go on to that. You really don't want to appear aggressive at all. You don't want to appear like you're being rude to your opponents, and that isn't. Like, that isn't actually with regard to winning the debate necessarily. It's just that it's a method of competition where everyone knows each other and everyone has a huge amount of respect for each other and everyone is just there to have a reasonable discussion and no one wants it to get, you know, angry or aggressive. Uh, so you can, like, you can hit, hit other people's arguments very hard. You can gently mock them as long as it's clear that it's meant, like, really, that it's meant well and that you have good intention behind it. But in terms of making any kind of underhand aggressive humour towards other teams. That would that'd be frowned upon, I think. Uh, so yeah, generally, like, you can get a bit controversial with your humour in terms of uh, if it's not directed at anyone. But a lot of the time, you know, middle of the road safe humour is always going to be, you know, that bit more effective and is always uh, kind of will appeal to an audience more and will appeal to other people in a debate more. Um, in terms of, like, the kind of rhetoric that you use, uh, like essentially you have to kind of fight through what you would consider to be your normal barriers of like what you'd be willing to do in front of a room full of people. Because in a BP round, uh, <laughs> well, it sounds like I'm a stripper or something. <laughs> um, in a BP round, um, you, like, you obviously, when you have that person who like is in a tiny room in a BP round and like shouts and just gets really over the top, Everyone's kind of like, this is a bit awkward, like, how do we deal with this person? Uh, that doesn't necessarily apply in the Irish Times. You can, like, you can use these kind of rhetorical tricks, things like using, like, the power of three and, you know, repeat, repetition and all that kind of stuff. Using emotive language, being passionate about your speech. That's all stuff that you're absolutely allowed to do and that you probably should do in the Irish Times. Because fundamentally, like, what we've been saying all along is that it's not a competition about necessarily how clever your argument is playing out against how clever someone else's argument is. It is a competition where you're talking about something that even if even if you don't care about the side that you're on, almost every emotion in the Irish Times, you will have an opinion. It will be something that's relevant to you and it will be something that's relevant to your audience. Uh, so they want you to care about it. They want this competition to have a broader impact where people actually discuss ideas and where people actually bring an audience along to consider those ideas. Like it's not just a competition that is something that we like to think has a broader significance. Um, so in terms of rhetoric, yeah, you can, like, you should let go of yourself a bit and, like, yeah, sure. So what would be an example of when you personally consciously broke down a barrier and did something in a, in a big round? Okay. Um, or, or someone else. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I assume that there is one in the final somewhere. Well, yeah, there was actually at the beginning of uh, my speech in the final, uh, I opened it by talking about the origins of the party, which was when they were founded, they refused to go into Parliament because they thought that the Irish Free State was illegitimate because the six counties were still partitioned. Um, a year after they refused to go into the Parliament, when nothing had changed, they just went in anyway. And they were like, you know what, we're tired of not having power, we want that power. Um, that was after they fought a civil war essentially over this issue. Um, so there was a point at which I said, a year later, they went into government. Uh, the people who died in the Civil War were still dead, uh, which is something that I generally, like in a BP round, I wouldn't say because I'd be afraid it looked too emotional and too kind of uh, emotive, I guess. Um, but, you know, they're, they're the kind of things that you can say in the Irish Times, and in my opinion, that you should say in the Irish Times from time to time. Like, the example I take from Niall's speech that same night is that uh, we spoke about, and this is this is an example of how you know you can touch on controversial issues. We spoke about the fact that this party has consistently delegated its governmental responsibility to individuals, so they don't take active stances on things like abortion, on things like you know gay rights or uh, you know divorce, marital rights, all that kind of stuff. 
and it's not that they take a stance against it. They just let the problem go on because they don't have the courage, essentially, to bring the legislation, le legislation themselves. So what Niall said is that uh, he named a couple of people who have had to throw themselves in front of the courts looking for justice because the government didn't provide it. And then he made a point where he said, and there's all these people that we don't even know, a girl called X, uh, whom, whom we'll never know. The X case was a case where uh, a 14 year old rape victim wanted an abortion and couldn't get one. Um, so I guess that that's the kind of thing that is incredibly difficult to say and that you know can be quite scary to say when you're not sure how an audience is going to respond to it. Uh, but ultimately, like we really thought that was the important argument that had to be made. <coughs> uh, so we wanted, even though it was difficult, we decided that we should do it anyway, essentially. Um, and I think it, it came across quite well, and people responded very well to it. But it was a bit, bit of a leap of faith. Um, but hopefully, like, they're the kind of leaps of faith that make or break a speech. Like, there is a chance that it's going to harm you, but there's also a chance that it's going to be what makes your speech excellent rather than good. So that's totally worth it. Yeah, and it's worth re-emphasizing that that's the type of thing that you'd never ever do in a VP round, because it's not going to get you any extra points for, uh, for pulling on the heartstrings, even if you're right. And you risk alienating the adjudicators, but because there is the they have to just swing the audience in your direction, it's worth trying to pluck on their heartstrings, even if that means occasionally being a bit cheesy or a bit over the top. Yeah, like essentially, if you have an opinion that like, that you're occasionally a bit embarrassed to voice to its fullest extent uh, in the Irish Times, people will appreciate it if you do do that. Um, but ultimately, like. I think that there's a limit to the extent to which anyone can um, tell anyone else how to style a speech, what kind of you know presentation they should give. Uh, the most important thing is that you have your own very distinctive style in the Irish Times, that people remember your speech as being yours and that you're differentiated from everyone else. Um, and essentially that means that there's, and it's very difficult, but Irish speakers who are coming up through college are consistently kind of expected not to try and copy other people, like not to rely on things like debate jargon or speaking really fast or speaking like the really good debater in the society. They're expected to find their own way to voice their own opinions. Um, like I think there's quite a lot of authenticity that's expected from people uh, and ultimately that's just something that you have to kind of battle out in your own and do give lots of speeches and hope that you, you know, work it out in the end. Uh, so if there aren't, are there any questions? Cool, well I think that we're going to try and practice. Or yeah, would anyone like to take a swing at doing one of these debates? Maybe? Yeah. Everyone. Oh. How many do we have? One, two, three, four. Don't be shy. Twelve, is it? We have yeah, twelve or just over twelve. Twelve would be perfect. We could do a standard quarter of ten. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I reckon that we'll go with five minutes each. Uh, just so that we all get out of here. At some point. So this is typically Are we just doing it? Seven? Like, okay. Are we just doing it? Does anyone just have a teammate here? They always speak of the like to. No. No. And what do you think? Do you think we'll have a good job? Yeah. Does anyone like to be an individual? I have no idea what that means. But <laughs> <laughs> I was listening. Uh, no, 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 no. Do you remember? Do you remember who said that there'll be there'll be teams and individuals? So you'll be basically one of the people who got split from your teammate, or, <coughs> or you, an, an individual. So there's room picking out for four teams. <laughs>